podcast world. This is Caribbean Power Lunch, where we feature Black-owned businesses. I am your host, Kevin Valley, and I am joined today by Celine Griffith. Hi, podcast world. Nice to be with you all again. Yes, yes. But this is got special day, Celine. Yes. Today we are joined by TV and film producer, director, businesswoman, published author, childhood poet, but most of all, mother of Gabrielle Branch. That's the most important thing. That is. The most important <laughs> thing. Lisa Wickham, welcome to the cabin studios. How are you doing? I love it here. I love it. Can I take a residence here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, so Lisa, people regard you as the godmother of the TV and film industry in China. No, I never knew that. Oh, you never knew that? So maybe no. just that, my one friend who said that. <laughs> They did not share that with me. <laughs> so well, you have a new title. Yes. So when, I've heard Iron Lady. I've heard Oprah of the Caribbean. I've never heard Godmother of Oprah. Oprah TV. Yes. Oprah. That's even better than Godmother. That's I got that one in Miami a few years ago. Train E Zone, yes. But how, how do you oh. feel about that? How do you feel about being regarded as the Oprah of, of the, the TV Caribbean. and film industry? What does that mean to you? Oprah of the Caribbean? Well, it comes with a lot of responsibility, but I also take it as a blessing, as an honor. But with honor, I believe, comes responsibility. So I wish I had Oprah's billions. <laughs> <laughs> but you're on your way there, I'm sure. <laughs> I, from your lips to God's ears, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, goodness. So, childhood poet. Mm -hmm. That's how you got your, your whole start into this, answer. Huh, so? Yes, absolutely. At the age of six, well, I started writing Around the age of six, my first poem was called Pretty Birds in the Trees. Okay. And German, Erishay Mitchell, anti-German, was the host of um, Ricky Tiki. Mm -hmm. To date, the only live children's show on our national television station, TTT. So I went on to read my poem on that show and continued as a cast member, a general cast member, until I was 13 years old when I was offered my own segment. Yeah. But um, Gabrielle beat you there because Gabrielle started off when she At the age five. of five, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yes. as they say, our children have to do better than we did. And so. she's like 10 times better than yeah. me, which is absolutely fine with me because she's my inspiration, really. Mm. Just how focused she is and, you know, talented, and multi-talented, but just her level of focus. She's much more focused than I am. And you were at that age. Or? Than I am currently. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, she's absolutely very focused. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I always look at her and I'm like, wow, this child is, she's, she's in a different space, yeah. honestly. I mm -hmm. mean, yes, we have quite a few talented 20 year olds and stuff like that. I mean, she's been doing her stuff since before that, but I really, really find that she's very focused and she, the kinds of things that she's doing. Yeah. And no. has done, you know, yeah. like um, she produced her own children's show called the All Children's Show at the age Aww. of six at the Little Carib Theatre in Trinidad oh, she and Tobago. Produced it. She produced it and directed it, wrote the opening number with her friends, about six or seven mm. of them, five, six, seven year olds. And she told me my role was to bring pizza. No, she tells me she doesn't remember saying that, but that's what she said. Your role is to bring pizza, mommy, and to provide transport. And she literally produced it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that has to have to come from a place of a lot of support. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, she's driven I, by the support that she's. Because I think that I do believe that children need to be able to experiment. They need to be able to grow in their own space and, and to have a conversation with their parents mm -hmm. about their own identity without mm -hmm. feeling threatened. Correct. And I guess I allowed it, but I was also very strict. Huh? Mm -hmm. I was considered the draconian parent in the group of parents. Yes. She wasn't yeah. allowed to party until two years ago. Uh, yeah, at the age of 18, she That's could have familiar. partied, <laughs> really, yeah, that, was me. Yeah, that was my that life 19. too, that was my life too, but she could have partied, but to me, there, it had to be age appropriate parties, so yes. I couldn't understand the 2 to 10 and the 10 to 4 parties before a certain age, you know? But no, so no juke. Yeah. Nah, nah. Oh, no. Mm -mm. Yeah, no social culture, media. Lisa. Yes, but, you know, I think everything has its time, and for me, the nurturing years 
Um, you want to provide the forum where the child can focus on their schoolwork, extracurricular activities, growing, travel, reading, so many things that help to build them into an international contributor as opposed to someone who's just obsessed with party and clothes and fashion, which is fine. That's fine as well because you have persons who contribute to the world as fashion designers and creatives. I understand that. But I think in addition to that, you want your child to be able to stand anywhere as an equal to anyone anywhere in the world and have international conversations and to be able to experience life at a global level, even though they might have been born in Trinidad and Tobago, a little dot in the Caribbean. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Think global and everything. Yeah. So Lisa, you wanted to be a psychologist growing up. You've done a lot of research. I do a little bit. <laughs> I do a little bit. Yeah, no, but I, I also wanted to be a psychologist really? for a little while, yeah. And then when I applied to UE, they put me into bank and finance. I was like... They put you there. Oh, they put me there. Oh. I thought when they said you could go ahead and register for bank and finance, I thought yeah. I was getting a bank account. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, no. you, let me tell you, they put you where the money is, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bank yeah. and finance. Well, when I applied, psychology wasn't on the program. So oh. I had to find something that was available. So I think why I say Gabriel is focused is that, or maybe my brother, Robert, because he knew exactly what he wanted to do from primary school going up to secondary and then university. But I think I always liked media, but media wasn't considered serious at the time. So I had to find something to do when I did what everybody else did, which was management and studies. Not to expose yeah, so. your age, but are um, we talking in the late seventies or so? No. Early eighties. In mid eighties to nineties. What are you talking about? University? <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking late eighties, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But after, sorry, you did your degree <laughs> in management studies. But how were you able to, to transition? Adapt? Yeah, back into the media sector. I never left media. Oh no, oh, I so never. You, okay. Yeah, because after Ricky Tiki was Nescafe Party Time, which was like the American Idol right. or yeah. you know Britain's Got Talent, that type of show for of Trinidad and Tobago. That's the show that mm -hmm. Pants was in, right? Eventually, yes. But Wendell Constantine and I were the first hosts for the first four years. And then, of course, a number of other yeah. uh, presenters, you know, Melanie Hudson and O'Brien Haynes. Melanie, of course, is now on the West End in London. And then Gael had, uh, I did one episode, a special. Gael had a special for Will Aids Day, a number of live broadcasts, carnivals, live shows into eventually the morning show Dateline. So I was always on television and then I decided that I needed to own my own shows. So I started to own E-Zone, which was in the noughties, like 2000 and so on. And I think up until 2008, I was in front of the camera, but at that point I started to get more involved in producing and directing. And by 2000, I was able to dovetail business and the creative, like the corporate and the creative, right? Gwendolyn Williams, who is a lecturer at the University of Westerners, was my lecturer at the time. She said, you have left brain and right brain, mm. and you need to find something that allows you to bring both the left and the right side together. And that's what I do now, because as a producer and the owner of your own business, you have to really employ both sides, you know, to make it as a successful entrepreneur, business person, but also as a very creative person. It's really balanced in both sides. Yeah, that left brain, right brain is very interesting because... I'm wondering if that was your plan all along. So you knew, you always knew you wanted to get into media because psychology wasn't available, but you did management studies so that you could get that whole, I'm not sure what side no, of the it wasn't planned at all, you know, it really wasn't planned. I knew I liked media. I knew I liked stage and entertainment and that sort of thing. But I also knew that it wasn't considered you know, I was going against the green right. because, you know, it was get a real job and what is this TV thing? And, you know, but even so. now you hear people talking about it like that in Trinidad. And I'm like, this is something that is growing and it's it's very global. Yeah. So even if we do it in our small scale here, the kind of connections you make because of technology and access and that kind of thing. I really don't see why we are at this stage that we are at now in terms of media. Yeah. I really think we, we could be further grown, ahead. Though, we no, have, but Celine, we, we have. have grown because 
when I was on television, remember there was mm-hmm. one TV station, yeah. right? No internet, no podcasts. Yes, right? yes. I mean, it was great. Everybody had to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now there's so many opportunities. People mm-hmm. take a phone or they take a yes. DSLR and they go out and shoot mm-hmm. and they can publish themselves. They can mm-hmm. distribute themselves on YouTube, Facebook and so on. And they can make millions, literally producing themselves. They don't have to wait on traditional media for that. And you also have legitimate schools, the university, Mm -hmm. the colleges and so on, internet to be going around the world that allows you and online programs, people watch YouTube videos and they can train up themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it really is a case from zero to a hundred. Correct. But what happens though is that the industry itself now, many players, prices have fallen. It's a completely different kettle of fish when you're talking about survivability mm-hmm. in an industry that is so, there's so much clutter and so much activity happening. Correct. So how were you able to transition from talent slash employee to owner of Easy? Well, I observed Oprah Winfrey Mm -hmm. and I realized that she was owning her content. And so I decided to pattern myself off of that and create content that I owned, I shopped, I developed and so on. So while I was still a presenter on the state TV on the morning show, I developed eZone, which was funded by my money. So which meant I was the executive producer. So I owned it. And I just, it just grew from strength to strength because sometimes when you do it, it happens through serendipity. So it wasn't planned. It wasn't strategic for me to sit down and say, well, I'm going to do this. I just knew there was a natural transition and I knew that if I paid for it, I owned it. And then it also meant though that I was responsible for crew, for the cost of the crew, for the travel. So, and obviously I didn't have that kind of money, all of that money to fund it. So I had to find creative ways. And again, it was a first, it was the first time, the first type of show of its kind in the Caribbean. Previous to that, you had news programs traveling to bring content and entertainment to the various islands. I think it was Carib Scope at the time. But with eZone, we literally transformed the way entertainment was programmed, shot, edited, and distributed throughout the entire region. And the region started to see each other, see themselves. So we started to showcase the bands of Antigua, of Dominica, the festivals around the Caribbean, intra- Caribbean tourism really started to grow because of the way E-Zone, which was showing in 22 Caribbean countries and on BET in the US and BTG, was showcasing the Caribbean. And we heard people saying, wow, I didn't know Antigua had this. I didn't know St. Vincent had this. I am going to yeah. crop over. I'm yeah. going to start going to World Creole Music Festival in Dominica. Who is WCK? You know, Karimi, these bands. So, so yes, with that now, I was able with that platform to introduce product placement, product integration into programming in Trinidad and Tobago and then throughout the Caribbean. Because I see it happening now and people yeah. do it now as a matter of course. But at that time, the airlines, the transport, the hotels, they were happy to be able to mm-hmm. do these barters to get their product out. And we were happy, of course, because we didn't have to put out cash. It was a, mm-hmm. it was a lovely union and it facilitated the growth of eZone for eight years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pioneering and trailblazing. So I would say, yeah. <laughs> with pioneering and trailblazing, you get a lot of bumps along the road. Mm-hmm. You know, that story you told just now sounds real good. Mm. When you hear about some of the bumps. Well, E-Zone, the bumps, I still consider E-Zone the golden years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the bumps came after when you had all the competitors, the followers. You know, so suddenly mm-hmm. we went from being the only camera at these events to multiple cameras yes. and not just multiple cameras, but international cameras because E-Zone being shown on BT meant that we had eyeballs outside of the region. Of and suddenly the Caribbean was a hotbed for international content creators mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. said, wow, this is sexy content. We want to do this too. And suddenly we realized the doors were being shut to us because because they came with more eyeballs and more money they were able to negotiate deals with some of these festivals. And I remember some of the festivals that we were showcasing throughout the region for free Mm -hmm. turned to us and said, no, no, we have sold the rights to this entity in the US. So now if you want to come and shoot, you have to talk to them about coming in after shooting them for like six years, you know, five years for free. Well, that's business. You know, I couldn't look at it as stabbing me or ungrateful or whatever. They found a way to get international exposure for their destination and they worked it. Mm-hmm. But 
I think it was naivety on my part because I should have been charging, <laughs> mm. right? You know, so uh, that's one of the lessons I think as creatives, left brain, right brain, but the right brain clearly wasn't working as <laughs> well as it should because, you know, and, and again, when you're pioneering as well, sometimes you can't charge as, you can't cost the way you would like to because you don't have the statistics, you don't have the, you know, you're, you're breaking ground, you're making mm-hmm. relations, you're building relationships, but then other people who have the, where it all can just come in. That's, that's the risk that you take that someone with more resources can always come in and say, well, listen, this works. I can do this better for you. Go with me. And there isn't a lot of loyalty in this industry. I would say. (laughs) Well, there is loyalty among teams. So if you notice, you would find certain directors will work with certain actors, with certain Mm -hmm. director photography and so on, Mm -hmm. producers and so on. So yes, in a sense, there is in that. But in the broader scheme of things, the way the industry has become now, certainly in our landscape, it's really, I think, more competitive than it was maybe 20 years ago, where persons would have collaborated for the spirit of collaboration and not necessarily for what's my cut, mm. you know? So, yeah. So now people say At least that. that's my personal observation. I might be wrong, but certainly I believe that now it's more about what is the financial outcome? What's the financial return to me as opposed to, you know, we are, we hanging out. Let's do this. And maybe perhaps <laughs> it makes sense because the industry is growing and it's now becoming something that people can earn money from. But I think there needs to be a healthy balance between the two. So people see it as a zero sum game. They don't think that everybody could win together. I think everyone can win together. And that's why you're the godmother. That's why. <laughs> That's why. That's why you're Oprah. Oh, Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> I'll take a drink of Coca Cola that. Yeah, Coca Cola. Well, Coca Cola. Coca Cola. So why why they um the ease don't have to end though? It ended in mid twenty mid two thousand and nine, right? So why somewhere around there mm. because I started to transition into films. Right. Well, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's the main thing. I started to get more into music videos and films. I was doing music videos before mm-hmm. alongside E-Zone. One thing led to another. So E-Zone led to BT, mm-hmm. which gave more of an international platform, led to the MTV UK program Tribes, again, more international platforms. So then the music videos started to come and in terms of revolutionizing how television was done music videos were our calling card at the time because you know your name goes on it yeah and essentially home again which came in 2011 yes oh and 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 then i think also transitioning into like live productions through the BET connections you know sort of bringing some of that international production level to live shows because i always smile when i see can I say tribe? I really Salem. love how yeah. Dean Akin does, yeah. you know, with the lighting and so on. But yeah. if we rewind time, the very first lighting extravaganza really was the Cut Music Awards of 2007 and 2008 when we had to import the lights because we didn't have those that type of versatube and versatiles mm. and the amount of moving heads at the venue at the time. The venue had six. We imported 41. And out of that, the local providers started to purchase these uh, elaborate lighting schemes, which you see now at the live shows that you have throughout. So I smile when I see it because we broke that ground mm. with the Pioneer. Cod Musical. <laughs> <True blazer. laughs> you know, so, which is great. I love it because it's exciting, you know. I mean, I, the energy, Cod mm. Musical, was remains my single moment of pride in everything that I've done, that very first one, Mm -hmm. you know, when we were able to see these lights and people say, where is that? Is that Radio City? And, you know, we we introduced week-long rehearsal installation, you know. Mm -hmm. The venue was saying, why do you need a whole week to install? But, you know, we were programming because I had done an internship with the Junos, which is like the Grammys of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I saw how, you know, it was a whole week of rehearsals and they programmed the lights and things that you take for granted now, but Mm -hmm. we never did that. The artists were 
asking, why do we have to spend so much time rehearsing? We know what we want to do. I mean, I know we have to do a treatment for the lights. And like, what's that? Wow. So treatment an, for the lights? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you, yeah. So the, the light, our lighting designer who at the time worked with the VMAs and with the Grammys and with the Olympics and so on, he flew in and mm-hmm. we met him through BT and he was saying, you know, Lisa, I need to know what people are going to be doing on stage so that we could do the treatment for the lights and know we program the lights, mm-hmm. you know? internationally that's the norm yeah. but for us here you run up on a stage you wave a flag and, you know, <laughs> and that's your performance but one or two of the artists got it and if you look back at the footage you will see where you know you have lights changing you have a whole choir on stage yeah. the local audience has no idea that you have this whole choir on stage until the lights lift up and you see a different level of lighting and to reveal that mm-hmm. the choir was there all the time, but it was on blackout. And I might be talking this and someone sitting in the US or in London or South Africa might be saying, but that's so normal. <laughs> but at the time, you know, it didn't exist. It did not exist. And we were just excited to introduce it into the market. And of course, once you do that, someone has to top it and they top it. And now you have the Dean Atkins of the world who... Yeah who has an incredible show with the tribe band yeah. launches and so on. Okay. You say, make it sound like you're, you're natural. What sort of, I mean, what sort of training did you have to do to be able to, to do all of this so competently? When you say all of this, there's different levels this, of training. Yeah, I know there are levels, I know there are levels <laughs> to this. I know there are levels to it. I'll tell you one thing, though. One of the things that I think contributed to my problem solving, because I think at the base of all of this is the ability to problem solve would be my MBA, right? Okay. I did my MBA at Warwick University. Distinction. Congratulations. <laughs> 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 Well, one of the best years of my life, I must say. Mm. But the thing about an MBA, people ask me, why are you doing an MBA and you going into television? You know, most people, most MBAs go into finance, banking, yeah. like Kevin, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the thing about an MBA is that it helps you to, it, tra- it trains you, not helps you, it trains you like a surgeon mm. to be able to problem solve, to take things apart and to put it back together and to spot the options, the viable options within mm. minutes, really, mm. right? If not minutes, a couple of hours. So I think that was one of the things that in terms of my acumen to do that came from there. But also I think the feeding ground of creativity, being involved and being allowed to be creative from a young age to experiment feeds into that level of thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one. And then also being committed to excellence always being always told that i remember at holy name convent sister bernadette telling us or sister helen one of the sisters saying girls are you thieves and then of course the whole school no (laughs) (laughs) yeah i said well when you work for someone in those days of course they encourage you to work for people yeah when you work for someone you get a salary and you leave early or you arrive late or you give less than what you're being paid for then you're stealing you're stealing time from your employer Mm -hmm. now when you're taught that at 11 12 13 14 you know i realize now that's where you know building character starts from very young and that's why i I go back to the the whole idea of my view about what how children should be so it's a combination of things the people who worked with me early days at ttt the producers there who trained me and, you know, were no nonsense in terms of what you deliver and no compromise. And also my mother, who is a principal, and she is no nonsense up to today. (laughs) No compromise on that. So it's a number of things. Working in the international arena as well. Working as an international representative for the University of Warwick, which is not a creative job by any means, but it can be. There's creativity and everything. But certainly going there and being in the office once a year, twice a year and seeing how things are done in an international environment where people come in and they do what they have to do and you can trust someone to deliver without having to breathe down their neck. They know what they want to do. So I know that's what Mm. I want to be. And then working with international crews, film crews, Mind blowing, you know, that people come in and from the time they land, nobody has to say, you're doing this, you're doing that. No, they come, they set up shop and they run, you know, so just being, I guess, in the right place in the right time, having the right mentors along the way. People encouraging me to read a lot, to not settle. I remember once Leroy Clark, I was doing an interview on one of my programs, I don't know, but I 
introduce someone, I said, let's introduce the very excellent icon. You know, so a yeah. lot of accolades. Yeah. And he called me and said, Lisa, mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't bestow those accolades on people unless they have proven themselves. What has that person done? You know? <laughs> and when I thought about it, you know, we use these words loosely, but mm-hmm. of course he was saying, you know, think about, do your research, do a lot of research before. People like Holly Thomas, when I did radio, you know, I remember Holly telling me to do Otis Redding, who might be somebody familiar to somebody who went to UWE in the seventies. By the way, Kevin. But at that time, this was in the mid nineties, mid to late nineties on radio, and he wanted me to play Otis Redding on Carnival Monday and Tuesday. And I said, "Are you insane?" He said, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I said, I don't even know what that is. He said, well, go and research. Exactly. Go and find out who it is. And mm-hmm. I had to go and pull up a whole repertoire with Otis Red and Percy Sledge. He said, nobody passed the 70s, right? It was a hit because obviously everybody playing soca music. Yeah. And this was an alternative for persons who weren't into carnival. And it taught me the power of research and about going outside your comfort zone. And, you know, so I think it's a combination of... Mm. People, places, traveling. Oh, how could I forget? My mother, she never gave us like spending money and that kind of thing. But we were traveling. I was traveling from the age of three. So being exposed to international environments, mm-hmm. different people, different cultures, being culture sensitive, having respect for people older than I am. Right. So I never had the issue of ageism because I was always taught that your elders always had something to teach you. So I spent a lot of time with growing up with persons much, much older than I was and learning from them. I think all of that contributed to... With all this travel, you learn any foreign languages? And oui, je parle français. Je parle français un peu. Mm-hmm. Oui. Deutsch? Ambition. <laughs> but I think all and, this exposure uh, to I I'm a like gum. <laughs> I think we learned that on TV, Lisa. Abu Dhabi. Oh gosh, but I, as I was saying just now, I think all the exposure to the international stage from the age of three, I really because I'm listening to you talking about. The kinds of products that you put out, and I'm always in awe because I'm like, how does she think about these things, really? And I mean, for what we have to work with here, yes, you do your research and that kind of thing, but the quality that we experience and we have been experiencing from since E-Zone up till now, it's like, it's always at that level. So I'm like, yeah. I think... But it was before that. Because, it was before yeah, that. Because mm-hmm. I remember on Dateline... I always look at the international, what, you know, what I consider to mm-hmm. be the top, whatever is the best in the world. That's what right, I look at, right? Right. And I couldn't understand why we couldn't have graphics at the time that look, but I guess it was the technical side, which I didn't understand. Right. Right. right? But I know I could do a PowerPoint back in those days. <laughs> so I used to do my little PowerPoint, give it to the director and say, could you use these as boards okay. to separate? Nice. You know, cause Story it needs, boards. no, boards. you know, like what we use, what we consider. Okay. If you're looking at some of the international, or even some of the local channels mm-hmm. will have the boards to separate. So if you say, no, it's time for the weather and the weather comes up, right? Mm-hmm. That's a board. Right. But we didn't have the technology to do that apparently at the time. But I knew I could have built a PowerPoint or if I had points to come up and we're doing an interview and I wanted to bring up points. So I did my little PowerPoint. I gave it to the director and he would run it. Now, looking back, I'd cringe. It's like, (laughs) what was that? (laughs) But it worked. But (laughs) it was different. Uh It broke the monotony. And in my mind, you always, television, Mm. television is different from film. Live television, which is what I'm doing now, is also different from news, Mm. current affairs, different genres come with different things. And if you're doing like a magazine style program, you want to be out there. You want to be interesting. You want to have some level of dynamism, right? So for me at that time, that brought that to that time. Now it would be like, what is that? But every time I'm doing something for the first time, I look at how can this be remembered, mm. right? I'm listening to you and you're talking about how you're mind blown by the quality of and professionalism that you see when you travel abroad. Yeah. How do we get to that level locally and regionally? Would you like to ask me an easier question? <laughs> <laughs> One step at a time. Yeah. One step at a time. I think once you have people in the industry and I'm by 
in no, well, first of all, let me say that I cannot say that I would never take credit and say that I did this all alone. Nobody right. can do. I don't believe, I don't believe in self-made anybody. I don't think you can have a self-made millionaire, a self-made this. No one is self-made because you, you need somebody to help you do something, right? Especially when you have a big, if you're doing a big production, you need other people, you need crew, you know, you need, even if it's a driver or delivery or the production, production yeah. assistant, there, it's not you alone. So one of the first rules is really to have good people around you, people who know what they're doing, people who are competent, they're secure, they're not threatened. And my personal mantra is no drama. Right. I can't deal with drama. So that's one. And then two, there are a number of competent people. We have people who can deliver excellence. I'm not the only one. It's really to create that space and to keep talking, to keep sharing, keep mentoring, keep developing. I mean, a number of people in the industry locally have passed through eZone or your masterclass, my masterclasses. <laughs> yes. Or they have worked on, for example, the Cut Music Awards. I always attempt to bring some level of internship okay. to whatever project we're doing. So for Cut Music Awards, we had like 30-something Costat, which is, of course, the local agency for education at the college level. So we had volunteers from Costat. And we always bring people in, younger people in. And when I go to speak to schools and so, I talk about excellence, commitment, you know, focus. So to me, that is what I can do. At a strategic level, it really has to be the will. It really has to be the will of the powers that be to say, this is the direction I would like my country, my region to go. And that's not a conversation for me. That's a conversation for the leaders of the various countries. Okay. So your master class, I need to let, get into the master class. <laughs> Celine should talk about that because she attended one of them. So did he. Well, so did I. Oh, yes, Kevin. Oh, oh yes. We were in the same section. <laughs> I was in the same class, Lisa. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell us what the different, the different um, courses that you teach. Because we, Celine and I, we did the presenting. Presenting, yeah. I actually teach the producers masterclass mm -hmm. before the masterclass i had the skill shops under the e-zone brand and i would teach presenting the same one that you all attended i did the mm -hmm. presenting skills from a different perspective but similar end goal the masterclass came out of when i realized that i had met and worked with so many talented people around the world i said you know what i could bring some of these people i always want to bring you know mm. somebody told me once i can't remember who they said lisa you train in your competition what is wrong with you <laughs> you know but i also come from a background of education and training as the former general manager of the institute of business which is now the art of lock okay, jack right okay. so that whole and just like doing a lot of training trainers and so on so i love to train i love to develop i think that's my purpose in like mm. developing others so it is yes training my competition and it has happened but I just can't stop doing it. So whenever I meet people outside the region who I feel could contribute to the region, I'm always saying, can you come and do this in Trinidad? Can you come and do this workshop in Trinidad? So I realized that I had that opportunity and that's where the master class was born. But the Caribbean Film and Media Academy was set up since 2007 with a similar objective. And I've had people from BBC come in and from Canada and the UK and, you know, lighting designers and so on come in. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a master class at the time. It was a full workshop. So but of course day? the market trained is that what so one day some of them were one day some of them were three days five days it depended on the content itself but that was pre all these film schools that are free <laughs> and as you know <laughs> it's not free to fly someone from the uk so you don't sound too happy about these film <laughs> schools Lisa. no i i don't get upset you know i get strategic so i can't stop governments giving free education and you know it's opening up opportunities to other people so you have to look at how do you uh reinvent yourself how do you step away and come back and say okay this is what is the current situation back to the mba right mm -hmm. this is what it is how can i reorient my business myself to navigate this new space and essentially that's what i had to do I would say that masterclass was excellent. And I think I told you that you probably, well, you clearly didn't remember, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I told you there that it was grossly underpriced. 
but I was happy to pay the price. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, the next time you make up for the difference, right? <laughs> I'll refer people and they will make up. <laughs> yeah. So we want to do a little masterclass of our own. Like a 10 minute masterclass. About women? No. Oh. What? what he said. <laughs> of our own, he oh. said. <laughs> of our own. <laughs> So you want to walk through the, let's go, let's do film production. You want to walk through the film production process. Yeah. All right. So just from the, well, we, we were discussing before we start recording, if there's seven stages or three stages, but let's break it down to three stages, right? So the pre-production stage, I guess the planning stage and then the production stage and the post-production stage, just walk, walk us through. Well, I'll tell you my stages because people have different stages, but they all come up to the same thing. So for me, the first thing I want to see is a good script. So someone might come with a concept. They may come with a treatment in their head. They have an idea. This is what I want to make this movie about. For me, that's early, early days. What's a um, treatment, sir? A treatment is maybe two paragraphs of what... Are you letting a masterclass for free here, right here now, Kevin? He says a 10 minute pastor class. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like I'll send you my bill after. But you know, for send whether you're doing an advertisement well. or mm-hmm. a television show or a lighting design or whatever, it's like a two paragraph of to give you an idea of what the end product would look like, yeah. the story itself in a very short, you know, it's more than a concept, but similar mm-hmm. to a concept. So they come with that. But that's like the germ or maybe just the idea they may have. You know, I have an idea for this. This is the character, whatever. But then you have to build out that story into a script or a screenplay. And from there, for me, my process begins at that point because it is at that point I would start to break out, similar to what a first assistant director would do, break out locations. And in my head as a producer, I'm starting to think, okay, this will range about X price mm-hmm. because the next thing you do is work out what your budget would be. Your budget will vary based on who you have attached to it, whether it's whether you have like a lead, mm-hmm. a very expensive actor, a very expensive director. But generally in the local setting, it would have a range based on what the costs of production are in that market or in this local market. And then from there, one you start to look for finance, you know, you have to find the money yes. to make this, which is the part that could take mm-hmm. 10, 15 years or if you're blessed and take 10 months. And once you have, once you secure your budget, well, you also want to look at distribution as well. You know, you want to look at where is this film going to show festivals versus theatrical mm-hmm. release? Uh, how are you going to make back the money? Or if you want to make that as money. A, as a finance, I'll just give you a little tip right yeah. there. There's a little mm-hmm. tip for everybody out there. When it comes to looking for the finance, see that distribution um, segment you just spoke about there? Yeah. That needs to be ironclad. Because the movie could be as sexy and as excellent as whatever, but if it's not going to sell, yeah, exactly. You, you don't know yeah. going to sell. It could exactly. be exactly. But then be people a... have different objectives because some people are not interested, and they'll tell you, "I'm not mm. interested in bums in seats. I want to make a film. I don't want to make a movie. I want to make a film." And a lot of creatives get caught up with that, but you know, and they just want to make a film to tell a story. They want to probably bring light to a situation in the world that they feel needs a voice. That's different from someone who wants to make money on a film you know, two two separate objectives and you have to be clear what the objective is you also have to be truthful to yourself is this a film that has the opportunity to become a blockbuster mm. or is this more of an educational type film right. that would go through you know more of a documentary style so you have to know and be truthful because some people make films that are clearly not in the genre of a blockbuster but in their minds I want to be on screen I want to see my name up on that thing <laughs> you know so so that's that's the stage of production that you have to work out so you have the developmental stage when you're developing the script you know you you get in the finances in order and so on and then you have so I'm going to fast forward because I'm not giving you every, everything <laughs> for free one thing though yeah. if at that stage with this script when somebody presents a script to you and you talk about the financing you have location and all these different things. All of that is worked out in pre-production. Absolutely, because I have seen scripts where I've had to tell the director slash writer slash mm-hmm. producer, mm-hmm. you know, with these amount of locations, all these scenes where you have things blowing up and helicopter <laughs> shot and below you have drones and all of that, you know, this is going to be X amount of money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, 
oh, you know, <laughs> so that is a point where you're looking to see how realistic, because if you have a pot of gold, then you can do almost anything. Mm -hmm. But if you have a limited budget, then you have to look at how many locations, Correct. how many extras in your movie how much special effects, yeah. you know, everything adds up. How many picture cars, all these sort of things that add costs, picture cars. You, you go when you through. damage the people car, you have to oh, Lord. repay, <laughs> you know, you have to repaint or yeah. put on four new tires and all of that. Mm. If you don't have a proper budget, adds costs. Food, catering, if you have a big set of extras and crew, yes. yeah. you know, if it's many locations outside of your country, then you're looking at travel and a hotel and so on. So different currencies, the exchange, losing on the exchange, all those things go into considering a film. And then, of course, you have the actual production when you do principal photography and you go into the shooting. Yes. And that has its own dynamic. And then post-production, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the editing and mm -hmm. the color correction and the audio and these clearances, which should happen actually during or before. Well, right, so. and this is why I need a, a very big team to work with because they will specialize in and you want to work with the best, obviously. Yeah, that's the ideal. But mm -hmm. the reality is that when you're an independent producer, director, sometimes mm. you have a very small team because you just can't afford yeah, it. Yeah. And you have persons doubling up and tripling up in roles as independent producers. But if you're working with, and even an independent producer working with a small budget, mm -hmm. because you can be an independent producer working with a budget that's very affordable especially in our market mm -hmm. and then you come like if you're a studio <laughs> you know, True. because here is a different situation so somebody may have a hundred thousand us to spend here but someone comes with 1.5 million us mm -hmm. and then it becomes a different type of production where you can have people specializing along lines and keys and assistant keys and that kind of thing. So, and Trinidad is very attractive for filmmaking mm -hmm. because of the rebate that exists. Yes. You know, we have the 35% on production with a 20% lift for over 1 million US spend. So you could end up with 55% at some point. And it's a I cash rebate. At some point. <laughs> no, when I say that, I mean that the, I don't want to give the impression that if you spend a million, you'll get back 55% yeah. of the okay. entire million. You get back 35% on everything except crew. And then you, you get a 20% lift on crew. Yeah. So that, so it's only that part you get 55% on. Yeah. I was saying it. To the whole long it actually takes. Well, <laughs> Home Again was a brilliant experience. We got it back in six weeks. Mm. Um, Lisa, but, you have links? No, it was one of the early ones and oh. it worked. Okay. And the rebate can work. Yeah. You know, without links, the rebate can work. Again, it comes down to the will. Mm. Yeah. So the executive producer, that person, is like the CEO is. She or she, mainly yeah. the well, finance, like chief yes. financial yeah, the fi officer. The yeah. finance, well, not even the chief finance officer. Mm. The executive producer is the person who either pays for or finds the money for yeah. the film. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes never even come on set. Okay. Right, the CEO would be the producer, line producer, producer slash line producer, because they take the money now and they have to manage that money. The line producer, especially, manage the money across the lines. When I say lines, I mean the various departments, mm -hmm. right? And the so, various departments would include like sound, like, well, everything. yeah, everything. So you have. You can tell I know nothing. So you have like <laughs> the camera department, right? Right, which would be the director of photography, mm -hmm. camera operators, and so on. Then you have like the locations department, transport. You have like the directors, so the first and second mm -hmm. assistant directors, the assistant directors, and so on. Production, you know, the office producers, the production assistant, production coordinators, and so on. Then you have things like costume and uh, makeup, makeup and hair mm -hmm. and picture cars. Well, that comes under transport as well. Mm -hmm. A whole lot of others. That's the hundred and something names you see. 300 names. Yeah. Animation. Yeah. So people look so. for their names because you did something. It might look like just a name scrolling up, but yeah, sometimes I, <laughs> sometimes I sit to the end of the movie until the lights come on. And then when they start to show like the music, then oh I leave. <laughs> Unless there's a song that I like in the credits. <laughs> but Lisa, primarily when you take off everything, the education, the everything away from this, this is passion. For me? For you, yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. Because production. from six years old mm -hmm. to 
to now. Yeah. And you're sticking I love with it. production. So it's, I'm now yeah. the creative producer of No mm. Morning Show on TT. Yeah. Every single morning. <laughs> I have to love it because yeah. I have to get up at three. And before now, I used to go to bed at three. You see? I used to go to bed at three, four o'clock in so the morning. you love getting up at three? To go to the show. To, to the show, yeah. <laughs> but I am not a morning person. Mm-hmm. But I love it. I, I think I'm the most creative I've ever been in my life yeah. on this program. So I've been creative, yes, but now mm. I feel like I'm, I get into a completely different zone mm. through six to eight. And I'll tell you why, because we're doing something completely different. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you all realize this, but we are transforming the landscape of morning television on Caribbean TV. Mm-hmm. Because when Julian Rogers came to Trinidad and Tobago many years ago and he introduced mm-hmm. the morning edition, which was a format that was, you know, very CNN and yes. it was groundbreaking and I was like, wow, what's this? Yeah, you know, and yeah. we loved it. But I was what, at least 15 years ago now. Had it. it was yeah, after more the coup. Than that. It was yeah. long after the coup. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a while mm-hmm. now. So, you know, I started to feel like, okay, I personally, because mm. I did that that format before up to 2005 and for me you know it is successful yes but I needed something different I needed something more positive more uplifting thank god you know more creative <laughs> and when I realized that the new TTT was going in that direction I was like jumping over the yeah. moon so now you know we have up to about 13 interviews sometimes 15 interviews on a morning wow and people said Lisa there's no way you're gonna fill 15 interviews every morning we have to turn back you know, we are booked two weeks in advance. There's so much activity out there. And, mm. you know, and it is possible to do a three minute interview. You know, people got used to these 20 minute and 15 minute interviews. You can do a two minute interview and get it out, depending on what the content is. Do, you need to coach me on how to do those. Um, the shorter interviews, yeah, but it depends on what the content is <laughs> exactly. and what the objective is. But, you know, if it is fun and light mm-hmm. and, you know, you get, you touch on all the issues, but, it's not the show. It's not hard talk, BBC hard talk, where you sit yeah. for an hour and have really an in depth. You know, yeah. I like the other morning shows. I mean, I look at all, but I'm like, it's too heavy on a morning. You're getting dressed for work, or you just got to the office, and you're like, oh gosh, I have to hear about politics, boy. I want something a little lighter. Yeah. And that's so I was happy we, to see that. Yes, and you know, and it's a lot of energy. You know, mm. you have three produ- three presenters. Yes, you have moving cameras. You're standing. You, know, you walk. You're standing. Yeah. There's a lot of energy, and you know, there are people who say, "Why are they standing? You all don't mm. have chairs. You can't afford chairs. You don't get that, right?" <laughs> but guess what? We do have chairs. Yeah. And sometimes I had an 83 year old blind lady come on set, mm. and I said, "Would you like to sit?" She said, "And isn't this chairs a very divided? Isn't this a standing show?" I, love I said, it. "Yeah." She said, "Well, I want to stand." I love I it. I said, "Well, you." <laughs> because you know but what they tell me is that you know the standing you feel the energy and the vitality yes. and the youth and because we have a young crew you know and it's just it's a morning, fabulous so, yeah. so i feel as if i go into a zone you know i live mm. my foot is injured i'm not supposed to be standing i'm not supposed to be doing all that dancing but from the time <laughs> you know the lights come on i just become i get i understand what artists do when they go on stage and they start to sing yeah. i remember producing Destra's back and all and directing her music video. And if you go back and look at it, there's a time when she flings herself on stage and she's levitating. And that. afterwards <laughs> I said, you know what you just did? She said, I can't remember what I just did. And that's exactly the zone that I go into. And it's a, a television program, which ordinarily you would be in total control of your creative zone because it's an interview. But yeah. because we are interacting at a human level, you know, I feel to hug you, I hug you. I feel to high five you, I, <laughs> I high five you. Know? feel from it yes, yes people the, the guests themselves tend to feel a little more oh, yes, comfortable yes and that's the feedback we've yeah. been getting so you know it's a blessing but yes I'll get up but at 3 saying, o'clock you're saying you, this is something you love so you get up you actually get up just to do that but are you in the mood every day because yeah, I always thought about that you know yeah. like with even with myself trying to get into that kind of feel I'm like if I go on radio or on TV, I am such an open book. If I'm not in a good mood, how do I mask that? So I how do TV presenters it, you know, and stuff do but that? I don't know. I could only speak for myself. Right. Mm-hmm. But with this show, once the directors, you know, sometimes I'm not in the mood up yeah. until two minutes to six. Yeah. 
And from the time director says, okay, let's go. <laughs> We're two minutes standby. And suddenly something happens and I, at creative energy still starts. Nice. And they say, nice. cause so I might be, and they said, okay, go. And I'm like, good morning, Trinidad and right. Tobago. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. I just want to be, and I just start to see people in front of me in that box, you know, mm-hmm. and I just get into it mm-hmm. completely. And I take about an hour to come down after <laughs> every morning, literally. You know what you mean? Yeah. If I have to do a meeting at <sighs> right. about half past eight, quarter to nine, I do it. But I literally prefer if I could just, you know, we drink coffee, nice. we chat, you know, you just kind of relax until nine o'clock and then the meeting start, you know, so. All right. Love it. <laughs> All right, Lisa, before you go. Yes, Kevin. I'm giving you open forum, open mm-hmm. mic, open mm-hmm. stage, open platform. Mm-hmm. Just leave us with anything you want to say that we haven't covered today. <laughs> <laughs> Covered so much, but um, what to encourage upcoming aspirants in the field? Well, I think it's important to reinvent yourself, your brand, your product Mm -hmm. to be relevant, uh, to stay alive in this new world order, and also to be true to yourself in terms of what you're putting out there. So many people, as you say, they wear that mask. Mm-hmm. I see it all the time. Mm-hmm. And I wore that mask up until Soka Monarch of a particular year. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the year. We we'll stick with that as an Hennessy. And since then, I realized that it's so much better to just be yourself, yes. be truthful, be honest, be open, be straightforward. Mm-hmm. Because no one deserves a better place in this world than you. Mm. Everyone deserves equal space in this world. But you have to create your own light, your own energy, be positive and allow others to shine as they should allow you to shine. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that you should out someone else's light in order for you to shine. You bring light to the rest of the world and it will fall on yourself. And once you live by that, I believe that you'll continue to be successful, continue to be positive, continue to speak your future into existence and remember to pray always. My mantra, another one, is work hard, play harder, pray hardest. Right. You know what, Lisa? Yes, Kevin. Oprah Winfrey is a Lisa Wickham of the United States of America. <laughs> You're so kind. You so I love kind. it. I love it. I love it. I hope she's listening. Yeah. Oprah, call me. <laughs> Podcast with lights, camera, action. It's a wrap. Subscribe to Caribbean Power Lunch at CaribbeanPowerLunch.com slash subscribe. Check us out on CastBox, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And with that, Lisa, Celine, we're out. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Podcast World, Cabin Studios, we are out. <laughs> <laughs>